How are you? some coffee is from home, from my village, give to my mother. I put sugar, okay? Definitely. <laughs> we drink in small cups, but America, big. There's small cups here too. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> in the forest. You live here many years? I grew up here. Here? In this neighborhood. That's nice. It wasn't so nice then. I mean, it was better because it was worse. You have a job? <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, don't really want to talk about that if it's... Don't. Everything is. You're a mouse in my hand. You're safe. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, this is really nice of you. Do you do this a lot? What? You must. Eh. No. I'll never sleep tonight. Maybe not. You know how they used to say stranger killers? Like in the 70s before we were born? Stranger killers. Huh? I don't know what is that. Like last year you weren't here. So last year at Christmas time there were these murders and it turned out that this had been going on for years. I think five Christmases before that and they just hadn't told the public. And they just hadn't told the public but last year it got out. It was a big deal. Gregor would know about it. Everyone did. The whole city. It was tremendous. The Christmas Ripper. It was... Did they find him? He's at large. Or she. She? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> <laughs> I kept hope, ha, expecting something in the newspaper, but I guess he's laying low or he's gone. You think about this very much? Is not healthy. It's not just me. Yes, but is depressed. Can I ask you a question? Okay. What's it like? What is? Being handsome. Being as handsome as you are. I'm not, I'm just asking. Drink the coffee. Shit, I'm sorry, I... Sit. And drink the rest now. Oh. You know what? I put the draw. <laughs> In this? <laughs> to make you to sleep. Sit. Don't be loud. This is for me. 
this thing, listen, it won't be good for you. It's already such a mess that literally doesn't even work half the time. It's ripe with disease. Shh. That's my name. I guessed. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome everybody to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. And we just saw an uh, excerpt from Grimley Hampson from uh, the Julia Chark on the Minor Theater Company's work. So thank you for coming. I'm the director of the Siegel Center. And we do bridge here, Academia and Professional Theater International and American Theater. And we are close, I think, uh, to the New York theater scene, it's fair to say. We also really put work into it for over 10 years. We have done the Prelude Festival, where we show work in progress here at the Siegel. Julia was here two years ago, and also before. And uh, I think New York City, in a way, one could say, has a moment of a revival of playwriting, and or, or maybe some even say it's a golden age. We have uh, young writers or women writers, minors of uh, diverse backgrounds and minorities, but also ensemble work. And I think you and the work with your company really combine uh, the work of an ensemble and truly interesting playwriting. I think new times need new forms of theater, as we always say, and the idea of a post-traumatic theater does actually not mean, as Hans Tieslemann said when he was here, we don't need text anymore. It says no, on the contrary, we need text, but we need new ways of writing. And I think Julia um, is really someone we look up to, we admire, and uh, her contribution to the scene, to the field, and also in her work of teaching is tremendous. So this evening is a celebration of the work of the um, minor theater and of uh, Julia. So. Thank you all for coming and taking your time and energy. And um, also, uh, we would, of course, uh, thank, thank uh, Kate Benson and Christine Harun Ali, who we also know well, and of course, the great Oakley who came with us. So thank you. We are truly honored. And um, so um, we um, will hear an artist talk by Julia. She'll give some thoughts um, of what's on her mind, what she's thinking. There will be some responses. And then we have a short panel. and. Uh, and then we will go right away go to uh, the Q&A. The Siegel, I think we do have a great audience. It's important to have good theater, but it is important to have great audiences. And here, uh, all you and your faces, and some of them we know that really is a, a testimony, I think, to New York City and to the curiosity of a, an audience that really also wants to engage. So we're going to really have a time for you to ask questions. We're coming slowly down to the end of our season. We have new plays of Spain coming up, some young Spanish writers who would be the Julia Charcot of Barcelona or Madrid will be here. So, um, but this is an event tonight. I personally am very uh, uh, happy that we have it. I would like to thank Antje Ögel, who also helped um, to make it happen. I think also the idea to somehow reconnect to the tradition, to the classics, ideas of a Racine or a Phaedra, and to trying to uh, connect it to the contemporary world. Uh, Rancière, a great French philosopher, said actually, when classical traditions meet new technologies, and new ideas, then something exciting happens. Just the new technologies, new ideas on themselves often are not as interesting, just the classical traditions are not. But like we had a panel on Japanese theater here uh, this afternoon, and really hundreds of years old tradition, and Racine, of course, is part of that, meet a new, new way of thinking and new ways of production and new technology, so um, that really is exciting. And I hope you get a little insight in your work and we all learn a bit more, I think, also, and for helping to make this happen and uh, to Michael and uh, Elida and uh, George. So um, we now go on and hand over the mic. We don't even have to hand over, it's already here, right? It's, it's on. So Julia, and again, a big applause and respect to your work. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, also, we're just in this room. Okay, um, I, I actually am the Julia Jarko of Barcelona also. Um, <laughs> no, thank you so much, Frank, for, um, for having us here. Uh, I, you know, I think it's actually pretty rare that uh, a place is so dedicated to bringing theater and ideas together. Um, and it's so important to me. Yeah, yeah. It's so important to me. Um, 
that we, that we never know how those things, theater and ideas, are supposed to go together, um, that we keep trying new ways. Um, I do think they're different things. Uh, I want to also, yeah, thank Anne-Marie Dorr, Minor Theater's producer, for um, organizing this event, and especially the actors um, and the other artists who are going to join us in thinking together. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about our company, Minor Theater, um, and what I think is our relationship to tonight's theme, which is basically the question uh, of how theater and performance um, can usefully become a place where we uh, get into questions about the relationship between sex and violence and gender. And um, I'm just going to show a few images from some of our plays while I talk. Uh, so, sex and violence. Um, <laughs> I, I think that uh, just using the phrase sex and violence um, invokes mass media, right? I think um, sex and violence are like the trademark pleasures of lowbrow entertainment. Um, sex and violence as an expression is like a synonym for um, cheap thrills. Uh, it's like a shortcut to excitement. I think we associate it with pornography, obviously, um, but also like the notion of kind of bingeable entertainment in general. Um, and it would seem that theater, uh, especially the kind of theater that we make, which is to say experimental theater, um, AKA theater that most people don't want to see. Um, <laughs> it, it might seem that this cultural practice would, uh, would be distinct from pop culture precisely because uh, we don't have to offer that kind of easy thrill. Like we don't need sex and violence the way that TV needs it. Um, and that is almost the point of theater. Uh, but I am not so interested in a theater without sex and violence since um, both of these things, to me, seem necessary for like any kind of fun. Um, and I don't know if all of my collaborators in minor theater would agree with me about this or about anything, um, but I do think, I think that we started this company um, partly because we each trust and enjoy the ways that the others perpetrate these two things on and around the stage. Um, so this evening we're going to show you some examples we already with Grimly Handsome, started showing you some examples of that. Um, but I will also say, uh, right off the bat, some things that I think we don't do with sex and violence in our work. So um, we don't use them as ways of distilling moral clarity. Uh, we are interested in the ways sex and violence feed off and produce shame. Um, but we don't find it useful to present a logic of guilt, or especially innocence. Um, accordingly, we don't divide the world into violent and nonviolent individuals, um, and we don't uphold the distinction between violent and nonviolent desire. Uh, on the other hand, we don't pretend that violence is equally distributed uh, in terms of its perpetrators or its victims. Uh, we know that white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and capitalism determine who gets hurt most and most of the time. Um, and there's nothing ethically neutral about this fact, obviously. Um, I think, I hope, that our plays are also uh, always about systematic injustice and are always gesturing towards the possibility of a world that would be different. Uh, at the same time, we don't think that pleasure without negativity or ferocity is the most subversive utopia. Uh, I was going to say also, that we don't use sex and violence to sell tickets, but this is um, obviously false. We are always trying to do that. Um, but I'm not sure we succeed. Uh, and, and maybe that is partly because no one wants to get too excited in the wrong way in a small dark room surrounded by a bunch of people that they sort of know. Um, but I think it is also because of this other thing that we don't do, um, or that we try hard not to do, uh, which is that we don't replicate the fetishes, the shapes in which we've all already been taught to recognize desire and aggression. Um, so sex in our plays usually doesn't look sexy. And actually, um, our lead designer, Ousta Benny Hostetter, who's not here tonight, I think is kind of a, a major force 
in the campaign against sexy sex in our plays. <laughs> um, and this is because we uh, don't think sex is sexy. We think it is scary. So maybe that means that the only possible path to a sexiness that would not make our skin crawl would be by way of fear. Uh, I know that it's risky and also maybe dumb to make broad sweeping claims about what sex or desire is, um, since as my freshman year boyfriend liked to say, nothing is always anything. Um, <laughs> but I uh, am very sympathetic to the Freudian idea that subjectivity, so being a person, uh, implies a certain fundamental masochism. In a concept that has been helpful and also kind of endlessly fascinating to me uh, is Freud's notion of the death drive. So basically Freud is trying uh, in 1920 to understand why people sometimes act in ways that defy any logic of self-interest. Um, and finally he decides that we must have uh, what he calls a repetition compulsion whose aim is to get back to the zeroness that was before being born. So to get all the way back to being nothing. But what's really interesting is that this drive towards zero, the death drive, can only express itself um, by mingling with its opposite impulse, eros, uh, which is our striving to protect ourselves and reproduce ourselves uh, and assert ourselves, uh, and vice versa. So the death drive, because it's always kind of battering against the outlines of the self, um, is what first pushes us outside ourselves and into sexuality or desire for others. So in other words, sex originates as violence. Uh, and this means that there's a basic incoherence to everything we do because at the heart of what we want is something we don't want um, because the drive is precisely the space or the difference or the seam between me um, as the subject, the person who supposedly is doing this wanting um, and this compulsion inside me that constantly undermines uh, my consistency, my integrity as a subject or as a self. Um, and you might think that this idea of the death drive is at odds with any kind of good politics, and in a way um, it is, because uh, the drive would be the thing in me that interrupts my ability to be the kind of self that wants anything good, um, like a better life for myself or for others, um, or a better world. But the death drive would also undermine um, the political fantasies that sustain existing power relations. So uh, would undermine fantasies like masculinity or purity or whiteness or nation. Um, and I think, you know, we can understand these fantasies as attempts to reassure ourselves that we are intact and coherent selves, um, that what is wrong with us is always what someone else is doing to us. Um, and the concept basically of the death drive, and then I'm gonna finish this section, I promise, um, <laughs> just suggests that um, suggests that what is wrong is always also inside us um, and sort of points to the pointlessness of um, taking it out on others. And to me, theater um, is a really promising place to keep trying to see this in ourselves because it's a place where the theater is a place where um, I think we are always seeing selves come apart. Uh, we're always seeing bodies interfering with the fantasies that they are supposed to sustain. Um, and it's a place where I think we can stop trying to hide the kind of total unruliness of um, these monsters that we normally have to take great care not to be. Um, so that's what I think about sex and violence. Um, but we also promised that we would talk about gender. Um, and for the past few years, it's been increasingly clear to me that women's desire um, is a central theme uh, for my own work. And uh, in some ways this has come as a surprise to me since I've never really identified much personally with femaleness um, or femininity. Um, I certainly don't think there's such a thing as female desire if that uh, implies um, any kind of uh, claim that women all want the same thing or all want in the same way. Um, I don't think anyone in this room thinks that. Um, I would, you know, resist any suggestion that my own desires can sort of be correlated 
uh, with my anatomy or with my assigned gender. Um, and actually, I think that kind of correlation always fails. Um, I think no one can simply be a woman. Um, that's why I guess Simone de Beauvoir said that too. Um, a huge part of our inner lives, uh, I think, is made up of all the ways that we don't fit into the logic of gender, um, which means that the dominance of that logic makes most of what we are actually inexpressible most of the time, like there's no language for it. Um, and I wouldn't want to trivialize the kinds of suffering that masculine identity can impose on men, um, but I think those of us whose identities are more emphatically marked, uh, and I mean women, um, but also all minoritarian subjects, I think we move around in a world uh, that constantly reminds us about the identity that we're supposed to inhabit. Since um, unlike the dominant identity, uh, ours never just goes without saying. So uh, women always know that we are seen to be speaking, acting, writing, desiring as women, uh, even when that identity seems like something produced by someone else's fantasy. So maybe the best definition of women's desire would just be the desire that is always going to be misrecognized, always attributed to a figure that actually no one could be. Um, I think my plays explore this thing about women. They tend to center around female characters who want incoherently, uh, who experience their own desires as pushing them beyond the bounds of recognizable selfhood. And this often seems to require violence, and the characters in my plays um, tend to get themselves hurt. Um, but as I've already said, I think theater is always potentially cruel in the way that it can tear open the fabric of the self. And I think it can do this in a way that no other medium uh, can. <coughs> I think minor theater's characters couldn't exist anywhere but in the theater. Um, because they're always on the verge of not being who they are. Um, and the hope, I guess, the feminist hope of this theater is that being on that verge, um, taking it up and enjoying it, um, and enjoying the pain of it, could be a kind of superpower in the face of a world that would like to scare us into being ourselves. So um, that's minor theater, and over the next little while, we're going to um, read a couple more scenes from our plays, uh, including two from our upcoming show, um. <coughs> Pathetic, uh, which is an adaptation of Racine's Phaedra um, with hexameter and all, which you'll hear, um, which opens June 5th at the Abrams Arts Center, and I hope you guys will all come. Um, but what's really cool tonight is that um, three of New York City, uh, New York where are we, New York City's um, <laughs> most amazing theater artists are also going to weigh in on these issues, and I'm very, very excited to hear what they have to say. I'm just going to um, read you their bios quickly. Christine Haruna Lee is a Brooklyn based theater maker whose work navigates nonlinear playwriting, auto theoretical performance text, and promoting arts activism and emergent strategies for the theater through ethical and process based collaborations. Her works include Suicide Forest, Plural Love, Memory Retrograde, Sugar Shack, and War Lesbian. She's a recipient of the MAP Fund Grant, Lotus Foundation Prize for Directing, and the New Dramatists uh, Van Leer Fellowship, and her play Suicide Forest is published by 53rd State Press. <coughs> Kate Benson is a writer and performer living in Brooklyn. Her plays include Porto, A Beautiful Day in November on the Banks of the Greatest of the Great Lakes, Super Magic Wild Forest, Where Are We Going, and Desert for Now. Uh, her performances include Fondly Colette Richland, Good Person of Szechuan, Nomads, I Will Never Love Again, and Variations on the Main. Uh, she's affiliated with uh, Space at Rider Farm, the Soho Rep Writer Director Lab, the Club Thumb Biennial Commission, and the New George's Jam. And Okwe Okpakwasili is a Brooklyn-based performance maker. Her work includes two Bessie Award-winning productions, Pent Up, A Revenge Dance, and Bronx Gothic, which I think we'll be hearing from today. Uh, she was the 2015 to 17 Randjelovic Stryker, New York Live Arts resident commissioned artist, um, culminating in the work Poor People's TV Room. And her latest work was Adaku's Revolt, a shared commission with FIAF and Aaron's Art Center for the Tilt Festival this year. 
uh, commissions, residencies, and awards include the 10th Annual Berlin Biennale Commission, the 2018 Doris Duke Artist Award in Contemporary Dance, 2018 USA Artist Fellow, Herb Alpert Award, uh, Mank Choreographic Fellowship, NIFA Fellowship, LMCC, FCA, uh, Wesleyan, uh, and uh, support from Creative Capital, the MAP Fund, and NIFA. She's also a 2018 Hotter Fellow in Dance at Princeton University. Well, you don't have to go any further. And she's a MacArthur Fellow. Um, and, uh, and just to briefly say who else you'll be seeing, um, now we'll see Kim Gaynor and Linda Mancini in a scene from Pathetic. A little later on, we'll see Kate Benson and Ben Williams in a scene from our 2014 show, Nomads. Um, and then we'll see a very little piece, again, from Pathetic by Linda, interspersed with contributions um, from Christine, Kate, and Oakley. So thank you for being here. Rosario is sitting on the couch in her crown. Je le vis, je rougis, je parlis à sa vie. Un trouble s'éleva dans mon âme et perdu. Mes yeux ne voyaient plus, je ne pouvais parler. Je sentis tout mon corps et transir et brûler. Her daughter, Consuelo, comes in. What's that? What do you mean? Aren't you taking French? It's not like I can understand everything yet. It's not even AP. Sit down, sweetheart. I'm sorry you were worried last night. Whatever. Honey. What's up with the crown? It was a gift. <laughs> <laughs> From who? And what's that on your cheek? Uh, oh, it's calm. <laughs> <laughs> I paid a guy $100 to come on my face. <laughs> like a dermatologist? You, know, you don't know him. <laughs> How'd you get $100? Honey, we have $100. We're not that broke. You should wash it off. What if he has some disease? Then it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sit back down a second. What? How was school? <laughs> <laughs> For whatever you did after school? Fine. Isn't there a semi formal dance or something? <coughs> last month. Man, I hated dance. I remember hiding behind the pile of mats in the gym and praying that some older guy would stumble back there all fucked up on PCP and just <laughs> punch me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> Knock me out cold so I wouldn't have to deal with the dance. For $100, he probably would. <laughs> <laughs> that older boy doesn't exist. Never existed. Listen to me, honey, this is so important. I know you think you're ugly now. Don't. <laughs> I know you think that Clara, say, is pretty, and the guys like her, and teachers want to fondle her, and you stand <laughs> next to her, and you're invisible, right? Well, yeah, when MTV comes to town to cast the next season of The Real World, it's probably not going to be you they pick, okay? <laughs> You're not going to be the prom coming queen or whatever. <laughs> Fine. But, and this is the big thing, from now on, it is only going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, maybe 10 more years. It sounds like a lot. It's nothing. It's gone. And then, look at me. It's this. <laughs> it's decay. You have no. You have to understand that every inch of your body will be totally corrupted. No one will be able to touch you without shuddering. You look at a man you want. That desire, your desire, will instantly turn murderous because you know so well no other satisfaction can be yours. How old are you again? 
15. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <coughs> People want to fuck you now, Consuelo, whether, you not, whether, whether or not you know it, and it doesn't last. What's the real world? It's one of the first realities. Is there a letter from death? I don't really want to talk about mail. <laughs> <laughs> And this movie, Boys Don't Cry, comes on. Do you guys know that movie? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you don't, it's this 1999 biographical film about the life of this young trans man played by uh, Hilary Swank. Uh, his name is Brandon Tina. Uh, and it follows the tragic story of his murder in this small town. And I mean, the movie is so devastating, but so there is this one sex scene between Hilary Swank and Chloe Sevigny that takes place outdoors, and it's really hot. <laughs> so I recorded it on VHS, and then I replayed it over and over again while I masturbated to it on the floor of my living room. <laughs> But <laughs> to the right of me in this room is this large white built-in bookshelf. And on one of the shelves uh, is this box uh, with my dad's ashes in it. With a, It's a wooden box with a cross on it. And my mom usually places white lilies beside it. So I'm touching myself. And simultaneously, I'm really conscious of my dad's spirit and ashes. And I'm thinking. Is he here in this room right now watching me? But before I could begin to erase this heinous image, I fucking came! Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's like kind of sick. Like total pervert with daddy kinks. And I'm like, I guess these days, I want all the bad things. So you can just call me dirty sub slut with big dick energy, put it in all my holes I'm imagining bending you over right now. Yeah, that's my power move. And these days, I can't be so nice and quiet because fuck, I just read online that dating Asian women is a white nationalist rite of passage. I mean, fuck, that's so fucking painful, and I will seriously hurt, choke, fuck you if you try to pull that shit on me. But, if you want to know my real kink, it's that I want to deserve it all. All the pain that is mine. And my cum isn't clear and white, no, it's like deep, dark secretion, like amber molasses coming out of this purple-brown body. And I'll feel this, and I'll release this, and I'll come on a dick or fingers with equal pain and pleasure just like that. Many times. Many times. Many times. Many times. So that was an excerpt from my play, Suicide Forest, that premiered at the Bushwick Star in association with Mai Theatre Company uh, in February and March this year. Uh, I began writing this play in 2014, and at the time I had just finished reading Audrey and Kennedy's Funny House of a Negro. Uh, and in this play, Kennedy finds inspiration in her darkest and most painful psychic space. Uh, 
And she actually uses that very space as the landscape of the play itself. So that's what I attempted to do with Suicide Forest. I asked myself uh, what lies at the heart of my darkest psychic space. It turns out a salary man and a schoolgirl from 1990s Tokyo. Uh, in my play, they're both clawing for self-worth in a society that glorifies cultural, racial, uh, corporate uniformity laden with uh, toxic gender norms. How does a young woman find her sex and sexuality in such a nightmarish backdrop? Spoiler alert, they both fail pretty hard in this environment. And uh, we eventually follow the schoolgirl into a symbolic forest. And here the play kind of breaks down a little bit. Um, the monologue that I just uh, gave comes from this part of the play, uh, where now the fictional narrative uh, in the first half that was inspired by my upbringing in Japan slams into the uh, real-time narrative of my now Asian-American self. Um, I'm sure you're getting this from the pictures, but I played the schoolgirl in the production, uh, and then there was another character that lived in the forest, this demon that shepherd, that herded goats, uh, and also uh, shepherded people to their death. And this character was played by my mother. Uh, and so the play ends uh, with the two of us having a difficult conversation. Um, difficult because she and I don't share the same native language, and difficult because uh, our shortcomings as mother and daughter and in turn, uh, our ongoing intergenerational gaps were being tenderly witnessed by an audience. Uh, if you're not familiar with Suicide Forest, it is an actual forest at the base of Mount Fuji. Um, and it has been a famous, famous spot where Japanese people commit suicide since uh, around the 60s. Uh, it's said to have magical properties. The floor is covered with tree roots and it's easy to get lost. Uh, your compass stops working. It is a sacred place to die because you can die without being noticed. The forest's Japanese name is Aokigahara or Jikai, which means sea of trees. But it really became sensationalized as suicide forest when this YouTuber, Logan Paul, uh, entered the woods and filmed a Japanese man's corpse and then promptly posted that video onto YouTube. Unlike Logan Paul, though, my attraction to this forest comes from someplace much more cave-like in my body. The forest could be my body, and there's this desire, a uh, desire towards self-destruction that is so fine-tuned. This location reminds me that I have a generational impulse towards self-erasure when things feel impossible, and the repetition of that desire for erasure over time <coughs> has become part of the bedrock of my psychic space, to make myself peacefully invisible in the face of my own shame. That is, to me, is so undeniably Japanese, and it's also so Asian American, and it's also so inherently about an immigrant experience. Um, the forest, for me, is like a talisman or stone that I've been handed down, but it doesn't really bring me any luck. Instead, it shows me how to hold on to my pain, my <coughs> mother's pain, her mother's pain, and so on, because this has been the way we survive over time. And, a part of me really respects this. In me, but not always, there is an attraction to the voided parts of myself. And this play started as uh, just a recognition of what those voided parts of me are. But over time, and with the help of my mother and this Japanese heritage cast and uh, Asian American women-led team, it has become a larger conversation about uh, each of our voided parts 
and what it feels like to be seen collectively. And I just wanted to close out by sharing uh, some writing from Andrea Long Chu, who mm -hmm. I'm such a huge fan of. Uh, and this particular quote really spoke to me. Uh, in her own words, she's a writer, critic, and sad trans girl in Brooklyn. And this is from her essay, The Pink, Happy New Vagina, that was published in N, N Plus One. Cis women hate when trans women envy them, perhaps because they cannot imagine that they are in possession of anything worth envying. For my part, cousin, I don't want what you have. I want the way in which you don't have it. I don't envy your plentitude. I envy your void. Now I've got the whole to prove it. Hmm. Thank you. I just um, am going to get settled, and while I am doing that, um, I have a serious preoccupation with science, and so that might be something we talk about a little bit. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, um, the first story structure I learned about, and I think many of us may have learned about, and now I'm going to dip into some old time feminism, mm -hmm. was something we called the witch's hat, which I later learned to think of as something modeling a male orgasm, which is the rising action, climax, falling action, denouement. And I think this story structure has some things to recommend it. I like a male orgasm. I like to be there when they happen. It's great, <laughs> as long as I like to be there. Uh, but I think it's gotten really tired. I think it's worn out. I think when it works, it's at the work of some serious fluffing. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the reasons it's very tired is because it is ironing out a manufactured conflict that will then be performed in the theater through radical acts of consensus. This is when I throw the chair, so make sure you're not standing in its path. Okay. And then the chair gets thrown the same way every night, and that's what we all agree to do. We all show up on time, we all agree to wear the, the right clothes and say the right words on time, and we do that as best as we can. Theater is essentially, at its core, about finding agreement with what should happen. And so when you take this manufactured conflict that is at the heart of this particular story structure, what I think you can see is a, an organized violence made neat and tidy and expectant. And then it satisfies our expectations. And then it sets us down gently to go out into the world, cynicism intact. I am interested in a female sexual model and something that I think is interesting that I just learned recently to get back to the science is that uh, there are two parts of our nervous system that I want to highlight, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the system that gets triggered during trauma, during chase, during shock, during life-threatening events. It is called the fight or flight response. And something that's very interesting to me is that it is intimately bound up in sex. It is what allows us to have ejaculations and orgasms. And I sort of wonder about the female orgasm part because it's the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest, that allows for 
um, male arousal and female arousal. And so it makes me feel a little confused that women might go through that cycle, that fight or that, that um, rising action to the fight or flight response of an orgasm to rest and digest, back to rising action. But in some ways that is what it feels like to be female, is to not have this one-time experience, but to constantly have to freak out, regroup, calm down so you don't behave in an angry way, gather, get triggered again, freak out, calm down, you know, etc. I don't think I need to explain that too much further. Um, but, you know, what I'm, so when I started writing plays, it was because I was bored with the parts I was being offered. And then I started writing plays and I got offered a whole shit ton of great, beautiful parts. So I, I kept performing and not in my own plays until I wrote a play about um, how sausage gets made because I thought that was a decent metaphor for um, what men are afraid women will do to them, and which is to gut them, drain their sacks, fill them with their innards and eat them. So I started there, and I started with that description in the dark, and we couldn't find anyone to play the part. It seemed puzzling to lots of people, and then some other people just flat out declined and so someone who knows me very well suggested that I should do it. And then the director said, oh, I might cast you in that part if I didn't even know you. You could do that. And so then I did it. So <laughs> I used my voice in the dark to describe the way that sausage gets made at the very top of the play. And then I followed that with a romantic comedy that I wrote about a middle-aged single woman who is trying to figure out how to re-engage with the human race through steak and foie gras and red wine and good times. So it, the darkness I fought for really hard because the conventional wisdom is that if you turn out the lights, everyone will go to sleep. That will certainly happen to my mother during any play that I write. <laughs> Even if we don't turn out the lights, she'll see. It's okay, she's, she's a great lady. She just wants to make sure the set looks good. Um, <laughs> But so, so uh, I, you know, there was like this feeling of like, oh, the dark. And I thought, well, but I'm going to talk, so, so maybe I can keep everybody awake. But I couldn't see the audience. So then I, I, I kind of indulged a, a, a kind of um, addictive habit of mine, which was to try to play it for laughs. And if I got responses, then I knew it was OK. And if I didn't, then I fell into a kind of deep well of despair until the lights came on and I could, I could become more aware of the audience. But the point is. I didn't know that I was doing this at the time, but it occurred to me, and here's some more science again, when you're looking at me, the only reason you're seeing me is because photons from the light source are bouncing off and hitting your eyes. So we're having this little reflective dance together. I can see you because photons are bouncing off of you. And so we're doing this nice kind of even trade. I see you, you see me. My eyes are failing, you know, I'm in the middle. So maybe I don't see you as clearly as you see me. Maybe I see you more clearly than you see me, whatever. But that's why we're seeing each other. It's because of reflection and bounce and little tiny, tiny, tiny particles that you will never see. But that your eyeballs can receive. That's a miracle. But the reason you can hear me is because some crazy gas-related and vibrational shit is happening in this part of my body and this part of my body and this part of my body. And then luckily I have a pretty big head and so it's resonating around in my head and sounding sort of okay. But then the wave is traveling through the air into your eardrum and making a tiny membrane in your body vibrate. And then the real magic stuff happens inside the centers of your brain, the various areas, Broca's area, and Wernicke's area where language gets processed and made. And we're all doing that, and I'm doing it to you. You do not get to do it back to me until you laugh or tell me to fuck off. 
in the theater, I mean. In life, people have plenty to say. So this performance that I made in the dark about sausage, and you know, as an analog for what sausage is an analog for, and, and I've seen people of many genders and sexual orientations eating sausage with great delight, and every culture has some version of sausage. So that, and um, I was describing over and over again in the dark the ways in which drain the sack, chop up the meat, grind it, dry the sack, stuff the intestine, ground meat, not the intestine, that would be disgusting, drain the intestine out of the thing and then right, grind up the meat and then shove it back in the intestine casing and then fry it up and eat it. And I kept, it, it, it dawned on me that it was because the real radical act is for my voice to reach everybody else. And then I realized that I wanted to do theater because I wanted to yell at people and wear nice clothes. And I couldn't figure out what nice clothes were and there are these things in the theater, these people, this institution called costumes and costume designers and design and they'll fix it for you. So, disco. So I, I think that the, I thought that my plays weren't violent and then someone pointed out to me that in one of my plays, the entire family gets eaten at the end of the play by a herd of babies. And I worked really hard on that part but I also sort of don't remember writing it and this is <laughs> a, 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 a thing that I kind of want to say about, you know, so they, they were all dead and there's cannibalism and it was the fault of the babies and lots of people were really confused by it because the rest of the play had been a kind of charming if sometimes fraught middle-class Thanksgiving dinner narrated by sports announcers. And then, you know, I killed everybody at the end in this act of infant cannibalism. And the only people who really understood it without needing any help were 60-year-old women who were mothers because they knew that what the world does to mothers is that it sucks the life out of them and calls them doing a good job for letting that happen. I want to disrupt every conventional idea that I have, and I want to do it not by relying on the time-honored, time-worn, worn-out convention of a conflict story structure. I want to find questions that I can ask and not answer, but thoroughly explore and ring out and shove in the faces of my audience, mostly in the ears of my audience, so that they can help me figure them out. Because no one of us is going to be able to reckon with the complexity that is being alive I can try to explain myself to you. I think I have at great length and I will stop soon, I promise. But things are happening in my brain that are happening faster than I can register them. So I might say, oh, I like those shoes, but I don't know why and I don't know why I said that out loud and I can try to come up with a reason because I'm really good at that. But I have no idea why that's happening right then. Parole, um, judges in, in, in prisons who grant parole are 90% likely to deny parole before lunch and 10% likely to deny parole after lunch because they can't think straight until they get their sandwiches. And they're really smart people and dedicated and they have really clear terms and they have really big rational logical structures to follow and they're judges, they've studied, they've practiced, etc. And it's the sandwich that makes the difference. So I don't claim to understand my own humanity, or yours, or ours. But maybe, just maybe, if we all ask some really good questions together and stop swallowing the time-worn and the adult and the, you know, should be now bedridden classical story structures, maybe we could uh, start a revolution. Thank you.
Yes, I am. You guessed it. Have a good time. They won. Yes, yes. They serve those little objects with the cheese. <laughs> little animals stuffed with cheese. They didn't. That to me makes a good party. <laughs> good food to eat and good looking ladies. Well, there were plenty of those. Or you wouldn't be riding home alone, right? <clears throat> Indeed I would. Excuse me. Didn't mean to talk That's out That's all turn. right. Perfectly all right. What about you? Right. How has been your evening? Dull as a Jew. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, in this line, line of work, you don't. Yep. You lose sight of your Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, you're hardly ever anywhere. Somewhere. No, it's different. There's places, and then there's the empty space around them. The wastes. Huh. Yeah. But. You must have friends. Why must I? Some kind of support, <laughs> some help when these feelings of emptiness take over, some companionship. I didn't say feelings of emptiness. I said actual empty spaces. That's not a feeling. Like how you can't feel the insides of your body most of the time. Feel someone else's, but. Th that's what I meet, meant about companionship. You hungry? Why? You seem hungry. I'm you're the one who keeps talking about food. Because I can tell you're hungry. <laughs> I'm never hungry. Okay. I eat like a fox. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shall we eat? Shall we go eat something? Not if you're not It'll hungry. be my treat, please. What are you after? Forget I said it. Please take me home. I don't know where you live. <laughs> where are we going? There's a nice, out-of-the-way place up ahead. No street lights and no houses. Well, there's houses, but nobody looks out the window. It's tenement houses. I always thought that'd be a good place to take one of my cussed passengers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Night like this. Either torture or murder them. Torture, murder, moodle. Are you serious? Moodle in the noodle. It's 62 Wilhelmina at the corner of Clay. Oh, is it? I really insist. Take you home, take you to dinner, take you up the street. What is it her lordship really wants? Dinner. share something with you. Uh, it's a note that was passed uh, between two girls at the tender age of 11, and uh, one of which was me. What is an orgasm? An orgasm is what you get when you have sex. <laughs> but I've never had sex, and I think I had one. <laughs> What does it feel like? It kind of feels like waves and waves inside of you. It feels good. Do you go to the beach? Not that much. Is it easier to have orgasms on the beach? <laughs> it's just that when you stand at the shore, waves are coming in and then going back out. Waves look like how orgasms feel. But riding on a wave is not the same thing. It's not as good as an orgasm because the waves are more on the inside of you with an orgasm but you still should get really wet. Do you have your period yet? No? You're so late. I remember you had so much hair down there. You had more than Tasha and you were only nine. She was 12. I started my period like a year after I got my pussy hair. You can't get pregnant when you're on your period, even if the boy comes inside you. My boyfriend likes it when I bleed. If the boy comes inside you, 
If you're having sex, isn't he supposed to be inside you already? You don't know what calm is? It's a verb. <laughs> you know that to have sex, a man has to get hard, right? His dick gets hard? You don't know that a man's dick has to get hard? Didn't I just say that? <laughs> you didn't write a sentence with a period at the end. You wrote a sentence that ended with a question mark. I meant to write a period. Can you answer my question, please? <laughs> yes, his dick, it gets hard. And when he has an orgasm, you can tell easily because he comes, he comes, come. It's a verb and a noun. <laughs> Technically, it's called semen. And it's white like milk, but a little thinner. And that's where the sperm is, and that's what can get you pregnant. That is so nasty. <laughs> no, it's not. Sometimes it tastes good. You drink it? What does it taste like? Does it taste like pee? It's not pee, so why should it taste like pee? And I don't drink pee, so I don't know what pee tastes like. <laughs> Come. Come is salty and bitter sometimes. It depends on what he had for lunch. And he eats me out where I pee, so why shouldn't I swallow his cum when I give him a blowjob? What? <laughs> <laughs> when I suck his dick? Why are you sucking his dick? Because he likes it and I like it. When you suck a man's dick, they'll never leave you. And he eats me out and I love it. And you get him ready, you get him hard. When he eats you out, that helps you get ready. I wanna get ready by myself. <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> I think I know how already. I think I had an orgasm by myself with a Frisbee. <laughs> you can't have an orgasm with a Frisbee. It's too flat and round. You need something pointy and thick and long. And a Frisbee's dirty. People put their hands all over it, and it goes on the ground with all the piss and spit and shit and shoe dirt. This is my personal Frisbee. <laughs> no one touches it. I roll up against it. I think I've had orgasms in my dreams, too. I wake up, and I feel like I peed on myself. You must have good dreams. <laughs> Sometimes. Don't you have good dreams sometimes? I have this one dream all the time. I'm walking on a beach. It's Orchard Beach, and the sand is hot, like for real hot, like walking on a hot stove top when the gas is up really high, and I'm barefoot, and I can't find my flip-flops. So I'm hopping and looking for the shore, and I start hopping to where I think the water is, and I'm thinking, I can't see blue, but there should be water, because it's a beach, and finally, I do. I start to see blue and I just start running and I feel crazy. I'm screaming and running and I'm starting to smell smoke because now my feet are on fire and I'm smelling my burning feet and they smell like Nathan's hot dogs and Vaseline intensive care lotion and Newport cigarettes and the fire is rising and it's up to my knees and then up my thighs and I can feel it getting into my pus pussy and there are broken shells and the broken shells make bloody grill lines on my feet like real hot dogs and I'm crying and my mouth is open but no sound I'm just coming out anymore and I could feel the blood running out of me and it's running into the water and when I finally get to the water it's red but I don't care and I jump in and it's fucking boiling and that's it I'm awake BAM that is so fucked up <laughs> uh, so that is the uh, that's the first part thank you so much you don't, you don't have to go through all that um, so that's the fart, the, the fart. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's the first part of uh, Bronx Gothic, which is a solo piece that I did a couple of years ago. Um, and what actually, so I have to say that the work that I do is um, I, I use, I think about um, how far does a body have to go? Um, you know, what is the fundamental integrity of the body? Right? What is an, and, and how far can it go before it starts to come apart? 
Um, but at the same time, um, it still keeps going even in its dispersion, its, 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 its falling apart-ness. And so this letter happens after I've done um, 30 minutes of something that I call the quake or the shake. So a lot of my work does involve how far can the body, um, how far can the body go? What is an energetic sort of transmission that the body can have before we start to resort to uh, spoken language? So it's interesting. I do think actually even before you hear, I think you also see, and I think that you know there are mirror neurons, right? Where it's kind of what you're seeing kind of is reflected back on you. You're feeling maybe what you're seeing, right? And so there is a sense of what is the possibility of a transmission of um, a kind of sense of the body that can happen in a space and also what is an energetic transmission that can happen in this space so often in the space so i start and i'm going for 30 minutes an audience has about 15 minutes before they can um before they can uh before it officially starts right and so they have the choice do i sit in here and watch this for 30 minutes do i hang out talk with my friend but what is the shape of the room and how is it shifting i want to make that space and so I guess when I think about sex and I think about violence, I'm also thinking about this body integrity. I'm like, how much can we, um, what is the possibility for transmission? What is the possibility for the self to come apart and merge with, with others, right? Because I wonder if there is necessarily a zero, I think there might actually just be this other possibility, right? What is the, this, the, the subject's total breakdown? And how in a space can I create um, an opportunity for that. But also, I was interested in this idea of agrio, these, these, these um, um, and, and also thinking about uh, the epistolary narrative, right, where, you know, we're looking at um, the stories that are told in letter form, you know, the Bronte sisters did this, I, and um, Dracula. And so I started to think, okay, can we take these black girls in the Bronx and how much of their story can be revealed in this narrative? Um, while also um, this is existing alongside these um, moments of the body kind of um, coming together, coming apart, and, um, and also thinking about adolescence, right, where the body is in a space of transformation and transmission, and how can I as a performer also create the conditions for my body to be um, shifting and transforming in ways that I can't necessarily fore foretell. But I also do think that um, in this, the space that um, for people of color, black women occupy, women occupy, there is already a sense of a, a kind of fugitivity already put on us. Um, um, uh, you know, we have been uh, the subjects of a considerable amount of violence, and so a lot of my work, I feel, it might be about excavating um, the violence that's been done, and 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 then you know, opening it up into something else. I also think that, but I also think violence is um, a powerful possibility for transformation, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to mean beating and death, right? But just some kind of fundamental and radical shift um, in how you look at the world and perceive the world and perhaps yourself and those around you. So, um, just, I wanna also read something um, by this incredible, writer, scholar I love very much, Sadia Hartman. Uh, her latest book is Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval. And I am interested in these social upheavals, but she is sort of excavating um, these um, histories of women in the 1920s in uh, Philadelphia and New York, and I'm not sure what other city, um, who were subject to these um, what were these vagrancy laws, right? Where, and, and I think a lot of black women were especially sort of subject to these laws where, you know, if they were walking around at night, um, police officers could basically arrest them for prostitution or vagrancy, and sometimes they would end up spending like three years in reformatory houses, right? And this was especially, um, you know, when we're thinking of the conditions that uh, were created, particularly in ghettos, when um, people are living together, um, you know, maybe someone has a house, but many people are living in boarding houses, there was a sense of, okay, um, there are men and women who aren't necessarily related to each other who are living together, and they were also subjected to these vagrancy laws and that they were living under these, like, immoral circumstances, right? And so it was just complicated. Anyway, but... Um, but what I love about Sadia is she's also talking about 
just the idea of women also choosing to live freely. A woman who didn't have a job, she didn't want to, you know, work at, um, you know, she didn't want to be a laundress, right? Uh, you know, people were arrested for, for not having jobs, and then they would be taken from the reformatories and basically given to people who needed, you know, people to work in their houses. And so, um, but so she's so she's also opening up the histories of, of women who were trying to live a liberated life, to live some other life. Um, uh, you know, she's looking at Billie Holiday and and you know many artists and choral performers who were also doing um, who were not necessarily living a moral life and who may have been subject to these vagrancy laws. Okay, so um, all right. Wait, my gosh. Sorry, my glasses. <laughs> and you know what? It, um, my thing was not on the right. Um, that wasn't on the right page. <laughs> it's an atlas of the wayward. Um, sorry, guys. It was on the wrong thing. Here it is. Okay. So. No, no. You guys. <coughs> I had this on the right, the wrong page. It's a chapter on waywardness, um, because I also think I, you know, I, I love that word, because I think uh, it, um, it's just there are, to to not sort of stay in one space, to move, to to transgress, to find other possibilities. But that is, I'm sorry, my God. Well. Okay, I'm sorry, here we go. Mm. Uh, was I speaking too fast before? Could you guys understand what I was saying? Yeah. yeah. Super, superb. Okay, um, all right, wayward, a short entry on the possible, that's it. So wayward. Related to the family of words errant, fugitive, recalcitrant, anarchic, willful, reckless, troublesome, riotous, tumultuous, rebellious, and wild. To inhabit the world in ways inimical to those deemed proper and respectable. To be deeply aware of the gulf between where you stayed and how you might live. Waywardness, the avid longing for a world not ruled by master, man, or the police. The errant path taken by the leaderless swarm in search of a place better than here. The social poesis that sustains the dispossessed. Wayward, the unregulated movement of drifting and wandering. Sojourns without a fixed destination. Ambulatory possibility, interminable migrations, rush and flight, black locomotion. The everyday struggle to live free. The attempt to elude capture by never settling. Not the master's tools, but the ex-slave's fugitive gestures, her traveling shoes. Waywardness articulates the paradox of cramped creation, the entanglement of escape and confinement, flight and captivity. Wayward, to wander, to be unmoored, adrift, rambling, roving, cruising, strolling, and seeking. To claim the right to opacity, to strike, to riot, to refuse, to love what is not loved, to be lost to the world. It is the practice of the social otherwise, the insurgent ground that enables new possibilities and new vocabularies. It is the lived experience of enclosure and segregation, assembling and huddling together. It is the directionless search for a free territory. It is a practice of making and relation that enfolds within the policed boundaries of the dark ghetto. It is the mutual aid offered in the open air prison. It is a queer resource of black survival. It is a beautiful experiment in how to live. Waywardness is a practice of possibility at a time when all roads, except the ones created by smashing out, are foreclosed. It obeys no rules and abides no authorities. It is unrepentant. It traffics in occult visions of other worlds and dreams of a different kind of life. Waywardness is an ongoing exploration of what might be. It is an improvisation with the terms of social existence. When the terms have already been dictated, when there is little room to breathe, when you have been sentenced to a life of servitude, when the house of bondage looms in whatever direction you move. 
It is the untiring practice of trying to live when you were never meant to survive. Thank you. I look at him and said, you sent my sister out to die. And he said, how do you manage to get in here? And I said, I told them I was a present for you. And he said, were you lying? And he put his hands on my cheeks and I bit down on his fingers hard. And he grabbed my hair and pulled my face away. And I said, no. I stared up into his eyes and told the truth. No, I wasn't lying to them. I'm yours. Oh yes, and I still burn for him, but not the way he is now, that he's been through hell and lost his hair and fucked his way through the staff of TGI Fridays. No, <laughs> not as he was before. Gun in his hand, dog at his side, eyes gone empty except for the things they seek. The way a shark swims after a newborn whale all night. A wolf chases a rabbit through the snow. You're like that. A perfect hunter. Everyone who sees you wants you or wants to be you. How you find it, how you run, how your back is straight when you stand, how your eyes are colorless, how the things you say are simple and hard. Where were you when he showed up on our shores that night? Why weren't you standing there next to him then, holding the leash? You would have whispered a joke in my ear and pulled me aside and shown me the map of the stars that you hold in your pocket, holding it up against the sky. I wouldn't have let my sister go to the movies with you. I would have broken her nose if she'd gone anywhere near you. I would have made it simple. You can have me, I'd say, or you can have no one. Julia and uh, Oakley and uh, Christine and Kate to join us. We have one more chair here. So maybe um, reactions to Julia or you all to each other. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had to, yeah, break the ice. Yeah. And that was my breaking the ice. Well, um, do you have a question? Frank, 
a specific question when you when after listening? I would like to know how does it feel for you to hear your colleagues' work in a, in a you know in the excerpt of the statements and how do you relate to what you are hearing and saying? And <coughs> I'm really struck. Um, I mean the group that you've assembled. I you know. I was in the piece that Kate was talking about with the devouring, the babies devouring the family, and I gave that monologue. Um, and then I'm in Pathetic right now as well. And uh, I mean, this is kind of aside from what we had talked about, but I was really feeling the kind of, uh, the physical bonds or connections over time and also how semen came up a lot <laughs> <laughs> across the board. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to speak as, um, I, well, I think first I just want to say that it's just a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank all you right. for coming. And um, it's certainly a pleasure for all of us to have the opportunity to be together because we've all worked together in one way or another, but never at the same time. So it's always great to um, see and, and uh, complimentary to uh, everybody who spoke, I think was very complimentary and I sort of feel that unity, which is great. Um, as a performer, you know, it, it's been exciting for me to listen tonight because um, when I'm given a script, I don't really think about what it means. I, I start off by just memorizing the lines and reciting the lines, actually. I don't start off by memorizing them at all, as you all know. Um, but, but I start off by reading them, just reading them out loud. And I kind of, I know I have a timeline, you know, um, that has to be understood and memorized by a certain date. But I, I try and not think about that and just keep going until all of a sudden, something happens. Um, uh, that said, and that's, you know, sometimes that can be very frustrating, and other times it's just, you know, in the middle of the night I'll be like, oh, right, and that's what that means, you know? And I actually found something tonight when I, when I read something. Um, but to hear everybody speak is also really inspiring, been inspiring to me, and has helped me in this process, anyway, um, as, a, as a performer, to allow things to drop in that wouldn't necessarily have dropped in. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of both those things, to come in blank, you know, and, and not really think about what anything means until it speaks to me. Um, and also, at a certain point, it's great to hear, uh, I, don't need, I don't think I even want to be specific, but uh, it's just great to hear Julia and Kate and Oakley and Christine and hear the other plays that I've heard before, too, excerpts of them just uh, resonate in a different way. Um, as well, so I'm just yeah. thankful for all of that. Yeah. That actually makes me, yeah, I mean, I, that for some reason, all of a sudden I started to think hunger. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to think um, how as a, a performer, a maker, there are some things that I'm hungry for in the world and also things that I'm hungry to facilitate in the experiment of make, putting something in front of people. And, um, and also the, your characters, Julia, all have like this kind of incessant hunger. And, you know, it seems to, and yours, Kate, seem to be, well, clear, yeah, sausage. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there is, I, I, I found myself, I guess, wondering, um, is, is it violence or is it hunger? Is this, it's this, you know, um, and sex, if sex can lead to death to the zero, um, or again, is it, is it about trying to transform and not necessarily disappear but merge, you know? And obviously in that merging, there is the disappearance of what was, but there is a thing, right? So it isn't a void, it isn't annihilation, it's just a completely unknown, right? A transmutation, a kind of hybridization, right? And I'm thinking what maybe needs to start to happen is 
some kind of more pieces about our hunger and and a, a need to hybrid, you know, become hybrid, you know, ocean plant creatures, right? We need to start to fuck the world in some way, but not to not so that something is destroyed, but so that a new possibility is can emerge. I don't I don't know why that let yeah. That, that sounds a lot like what the in the city of Hartman ends on of this uh, uh, world in which um, what is it you're trying to survive in a world that in which you're not meant to exist. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this world where all these characters are very hungry because it's not sustaining them right. in some way. It's right. not designed for them but to feel too, sated. Yeah. Right, and it's to imagine. And also, right, how do we imagine something else, right? I don't want to replicate systems of violence that we are living under now, right? Is there another possibility or another framework, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think this question of like, um, your question kind of like, why, why zero? Like, why do we need zero? Um, there are kind of infinite dimensions in which we could pursue our hunger or transformation or kind of, um, radicality and shifting and change. So why does change have to be erasure right. um, or destruction? Um, and I think, you know, yeah, I, it's a good question. I mean, I think somehow to me, <coughs> the zero feels important as, a, as like a kind of asymptote, as a kind of, um, because it's like a form of perfection, um, that it's like a, um, it's, it's, or it's just abstraction. Um, and there's something about um, a movement in a, a movement towards a goal that actually can't be met, mm. um, that, that to me feels like a kind of perpetual motion machine in itself. Mm. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like because the zero is unattainable, I guess, that it feels important right. for me. Right, right, I mean zero, and it just, destruction doesn't necessarily have to be bad, right? You know, as a, a mom, How long sorry, uh, yeah. there, like as a, you know, moms, you push something is broken, right? Push, there's or blood, cut, yeah. or cut, or, right? <laughs> oh my goodness, I just, I don't want to talk about this, sorry. <laughs> this, this is a terrible thing that I read today that doesn't, someone, anyway, uh, yes, destruction, I guess it feels like uh, destruction is kind of, even that word sort of has some kind of resonance in a kind of Western European kind of um, framework, right? And it feels, it even feels kind of masculine. I mean, I'm no, um, I'm no linguist. I don't know the etymology of that word, but I, I wonder if, I, I guess I want new, hmm, I don't, I want the transfer, I want to think of transformation that doesn't always, um, that where violence isn't necessarily uh, necessary, even though, even though I think like the disruption of a certain sense of self is a kind of violence for some people, right? Like in some ways, what we're looking at or what we're dealing with as we see this rise of this kind of um, this white supremacy, this sort of heteronormative or this sort of Judeo-Christian like or Christian sort of neo-Nazi movement, it feels like they are. Um, railing against what they feel is an existential threat, their own erasure, right? Um, and so any idea that you would actually, it's, it's, we're not gonna destroy you, but you will merge, probably feels like violence to those people, not that I can like imagine, who the, I don't know those people, they don't know me, clearly, uh, we don't <laughs> hang. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, it's like, I'm just wondering about escaping certain conditions of language, and maybe sometimes that's why I go to the body. Um, the la language is in the body, as Kate was, you know, beautifully elucidating, right? Um, the body is these vibrations, this sound. But maybe I'm trying to go to a place that is um, pre-sound, where we're sometimes just in a room looking at each other. <laughs> yeah, you well, know, so I wonder, yeah. Something, well, I just did it, what I'm about to say, but I think that, the seeing is a peer-to-peer -peer relationship of equals, even if someone is looking at you in a threatening or a desirous or a judging manner. My mother has a look that can cut down, you know, mm -hmm. right? But, but it's peer-to-peer, -peer, and I mean that on the, on, the, on the physics level of photons. 
But with sound, what I just did to Oakley, what I, how I just cut her off and usurped her waves, and now they're landing on your fortunate and unfortunate ears alike, like, speech is power. And using speech is exercising a certain kind of power. And as a female child in a house full of men, I was taught not to use my hands to exercise my power, but instead to use my voice. And I got really good at it. There's, you know, through the variety of tactics. But I wanted to hit people. I came out of the womb ready to punch, crack, you know, kick, claw, bite, grab. And it was definitely more discouraged in me than it was in my brothers, which is just about some kind of heteronormative, middle-class, white Lutheran garbage. But I think that there is something um, that allows us to escape certain kinds of power structures if we stop talking. See, I didn't feel like that was a usurpation either, right? That's the danger of language, right? <laughs> this is the danger, right? Because I thought I gave over. I thought I was done. And I thought, so, so interesting, right? And so this is also the trap for me. It's like, OK, how do we make space also to, for those kind of, for um, these misreadings, right? Um, which are necessary and fantastic and dynamic against each other, right? And so maybe sometimes that's why I'm not sure. Sometimes, what am I writing? Am I writing plays? I'm just having different people sort of sp saying things and then saying the absolute opposite later. I mean, I, like, it's. Um, but no, I, I, I feel you. I wasn't supposed to fight either, but I did. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I feel like there is, uh, but if you, when you're talking about the, the power, like a sense of um, sort of voice is power versus what, you know what I mean? The, the body is not, like um, when there is no voice, what, what? I guess I don't mean a power, both things have power. Both systems, looking and seeing and being seen and look, hearing, all, all of that. But what I guess I mean is They're not that separate, right? No, looking is also hearing. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, su I'm suggesting that to look is a vibration that also has a yes. sound. Yes, yes, okay, yes, yes. Also, I have been thinking about how playwriting is tyranny. I wrote a play that has no gender pronouns in it, and I wrote it in such a way that I wanted a people a, a cast of a wide variety of backgrounds to be able to play any of the parts, and I hope that someone crazy will give us an opportunity to test that out. But I really felt like I was patting myself on the back like a great white lady, you know, for like finding a way to be in the room with people who might tell me all the ways that I was stupid and wrong and that we were all going to be in a non-hierarchical setting. And then it dawned on me that every single one of them while they were reading my play sounded like me because I'm not um, exactly a shapeshifter playwright. I write the words and then I make people say them and then they all sound like me. But I think that... Um, writing is also the way that we allow ourselves to disappear into the structure. Yes, maybe, yes. But also exert ourselves. It's a thing that I love about being in your place is that I might be the character called Joan, but I might also, like, that might not be a confined thing. That might not, one of the worst um, plays that I was thinking about to get my ire up was a play <laughs> <laughs> the first play I got my equity card in was a writing class. I had three lines. I said, I wrote a poem about my cat. And then I was immediately overshadowed by a more powerful woman who spent the entire play talking about a man who was not there. The man who was at the center of the play did not have to have a, an actor speak words. He was at the center, and he, was, he didn't have to show up. And it was in, it, it, I was thinking about it later as like, here we all are in service to the more powerful man. And it was making me really, really angry. And I had this tiny, very confined role. And so that's what I was to just make the link between power and power and center and who you put at the center and is there a center. And then this feeling of like being in your work and watching your work that people are, um, um, characters are more like vibrations than they are like fixed things that are going to do predictable things that we will know about. And they frequently seem on the inside not to have any idea why they might like to do something next. 
so that the whole idea of a kind of method acting intention is dismantled. And you get to really think about doing things with your body, like I'm going to stand across the room from you and think about plucking out one of your eyebrow hairs, because I bet that would hurt, <laughs> while I say this line, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, as a question to the theme of the evening, like staging um, and, and women's desire. Where do you feel someone got it really right, or what do you feel is how it should be done? Where do you say, this is really so wrong? So what does, you know, you, if one could say you, as a group, work together, know each other, so what are your... What do you look up to when you say this is something that really should not be, should not be shown or written? You just want us to like not name but in general. Shots. No, no, no. That's not by name, but in general, you know, what gets you, what you know, feel this is so wrong, and this is why we do our work. I was just trying to understand the question. I think there came a point last week where I said a line and I looked at Julia and said, seriously? <laughs> Do you have to like put that line in there? And, um, and she said, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> it was the, oh, I can't even say it. I can't. Oh, have someone say it. <laughs> come on, oh come gosh. on. Oh, yeah, no, it's a terrible line. Don't say it. Oh, no, you have to say it. <laughs> oh, come on now. But, um... Is that what the... Is that what... No, I think, I think Kate was? said earlier you, that theater is manufactured conflict or that it is, you know, organized violence. And so much mm -hmm. about the talk was about uh, uh, violence against bodies um, and uh, the questions you to ask. And so you don't really need to have um, um, the answer. And uh, how far can the body go? And if so much of what we see, or I see, what well, I would say, you know, it's not really responding in that way to it. So, but what are your, you know, in, in your theater world, things where you say this, these were works, these were plays, these are directors, and of course your work, but what does, it, what does make it um, right for you? I, first, I just want to say that if it's good, then it's good, then it's good, and it's fine with me. And that is a little bit like the Supreme Court definition of obscenity, and I would say that that's correct. When you see it, you know it. When it's good, when it works, it works on you, and then that, there it is. It's a very difficult thing to pin down. But I also want to say that the, the knowing part of me, which is maybe a part that should be cut out and burned, but the knowing part of me knows that I don't want to see cynical plays anymore. I don't need to see a play that is confirming my sense of the world as I walk out of the theater. I want a play to disrupt and trouble my sense of the world all the time. Um, I, I, I want to see people, I want to see surprising things come out of surprising mouths. Um, tonight is apparently all about mouths in my reality. Um, I want to see people do things that I didn't expect so that I can start to think about something else besides the sad, very low, tragic, violent, horrible expectations I have from living or watching the news. So cynicism. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, uh, I'd feel really grateful for um, all of the artists that have kind of taught me how to work through um, abstractness and um, coldness and um, deferring um, human connection and warmth. Um, and, uh, and have enabled the kind of theater as a, um, as a space of um, putting off, um, uh, 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 as a place to want communion but not get it, I guess. That seems really important. Uh, mostly because I guess I feel like movies and TV mostly give us everything we want right away. And so um, I think, our, I'm thinking about you, just like the Worcester group even, or um, uh, I mean, Oakley and I met uh, performing for R Richard Maxwell. I mean, artists who have sort of created spaces of um, where something is held in a kind of suspense. Um, and that suspense, which, you know, um, which also, you know, theoretically is associated with masochism, I guess, in other contexts, but that suspense, I think, is, is, is one of the things that theater is able to do, um, to take duration and, and turn it into, like, possibility in a way that I just don't think happens in other media. So that, that's important for me. 
Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, let's open it up to the audience. Maybe Mike, let's have some light on the audiences or comments. It doesn't have to be a question. Um, since Howl, HowlRound um, agreed to, to, to uh, stream it, we would like to ask you to take the microphone and uh, also maybe say who you are, but a question or a thought or a comment. Thanks for, it was a really um, kind of amazing um, introduction to a lot of your work and um, thank you for all of that. And I was just thinking about one thing um, in relation to sex and violence and uh, those themes was humor. It uh, felt like a really important thread throughout and I think often does something kind of similar about you know breaking the bounds of the self and sort of uh, sometimes can be that strange sort of abyssal zero. <laughs> um, but also, I don't know, it can be a space of suspense and merging as well. Um, so I, yeah, I was just wondering about reflecting on, on humor and how that relates to, I mean, maybe actually like humor is the sex? I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but there's some kind of relationship between the erotic and, and desire and, and yeah, and laughter, which is often also kind of painful. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question there, <laughs> so. Sorry about that. But if you want to hear it more as a question, I guess it would be like, um, what, uh, how does humor relate to violence and sex? Do you guys write humor into your place? Do you feel it has to be there, or does it happen, or is it automatically um, present, um, or you try to avoid it? We try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I think that, let's see, okay, humor, um, yes, I agree with everything you said. Um, uh, that, that, um, that humor is both sex and violence, but, uh, but also, I guess, for me, humor in the theater seems so important. I could never enjoy, I could never enjoy a piece of theater that didn't um, make me laugh or smile or, you know, um, because I actually think um, the more ambitious, the, so, so sort of like the more seriously we secretly take ourselves um, in exploring things like violence and sex and, um, uh, uh, structure, you know, um, the more vital it is that we not let on that we are taking ourselves so seriously and that we deflect that impression at all costs. Um, because how hideous of us to ask to be, um, you know, regarded in that way. And so humor becomes really important um, as the thing that um, enables any of that exploration to happen um, without a kind of um, like unbearable level of pain of self-seriousness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I also think that laughing is a kind of intellectual foreplay. And that if you want someone to have a new idea, a really good way to get at them is to, is to get them to loosen up. I'm gesturing at the dancer now, but to, to get them to loosen up I'm their bodies by moving. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. By moving their diaphragms, I, you know, and, and that then you leave them a little bit more vulnerable to attack and dismantling. Yeah, I don't, I don't care about humor, personally. I, I, I could give two fucks about humor, to be perfect. I mean, I, I, I'm just like interested in like, how do we, how do we shake the ground in a space? And, and maybe that's what I was missing too when I was thinking about movement, because I'm not doing like traditional dance or blah, right? I'm just, I'm trying to make something, it's a vibrational space and I'm just trying to disrupt something. And there are people who, you know, are in that space and are sometimes like, oh my God, I get the, gotta get the fuck out of here, right? It feels like a car, I put people in a, like someone also talked about carceral states, right? That <laughs> being in, watching, being in, um, 
uh, where I did the Bronx Gothic, being in that space was like being in prison with me. And I was like, but well, I just wanted it to be like a little bedroom, you know what I mean? Like we're all here together. But, but I was also like, okay, but that's good. That's also what I'm trying to do. I, I want to ensnare you and trap you. And if you have the balls, you'll get up and leave. But if you can't leave, what can we do? And then it's like, you stay, and then maybe something happens, or you just want to tear your eyeballs out. I kind of don't mind that. Though I do think that a fundamental condition of being human is just that we're just funny as hell. We're just stupid. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's inevitable that, that there's humor because that is the only way we can deal with our conditions. But how, when I'm making something, I am not, as a tactic or a strategy, saying, well, now it's got to get funny because this part was just totally like, mm, you know? Um, that's so... I think that that's really important is to, um, I really appreciate work that leaves the possibilities open. You know, I had a really, and I'm, I had a really great experience once I, I was performing this solo piece that I traveled around Europe and US and Canada with. And when I went to, I performed in somewhere in Germany, it was a hilarious piece usually. Usually, but it was it, it, it came from a very lonely place when I created it, but um, and there was no no text, um, and but it, it it depended on the audience, you know it was open to any possibility, and I think that I, I did it uh, in Germany in a town in Germany once, and ev everyone started crying and they had to take the children away, you know, and I thought wow that is just. <laughs> Fantastic, you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was kind of exciting in a way to know that it could have a, the the reaction could be anything, you know. So I think as performers, uh, verbal or nonverbal, with, with language or with with uh, our mere bodies and our energy, I think it's important to leave open. And I do believe that this work that we saw tonight could go either way, you know. And I think as performers, it's a challenge for us to allow that to be, to, to have an open, uh, open-ended um, possibility for that people can see it as something very humorous or see it as something very sad, depending on who they are in their personal experience. So that's the challenge for me and the exciting, exciting part. Maybe a question to Julia. Uh, why Racine and um, as a starting point, Fiedra, why not say Helen Sissou or Susan Sontag, Janet Jackson? What is, what, is your, what, is, what is your thought behind it? Well, I like old things that feel old and weird and, um, you know, uncomfortable. So Helen Sissou doesn't need me, but I actually think Racine does need me. Um, and, uh, and I guess I think, um, you know, the ways in which, um, theater has, you know, it's, I, I think taking, um, taking a classic structure, um, that has taught so many people how to think about sex and how to think about violence and trying to kind of like, open up and incorporate that structure and see what happens when you have it inside your body. Um, to me, it feels um, scary and exciting and, um, yeah, and I like writing in hexameter, too. It will be, will be interesting. So June 5th, you say, is the opening? June 5th. So we all have to go. I certainly will be there. And as a closing thing, what's up in the um, oven again for the minor theater afterwards? Are you already thinking about next projects? What, you, what will you be doing? And maybe the same for um, Kate and also Opie. So, but maybe you first. What are, what are you working on? Me first. Um, uh, well, speaking of incorporating horrible objects, um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're doing an adaptation of Wojciech. So, um, more um, misogynistic violence for you coming up. Um, Christine, what about you? Hi, uh, we're remounting Suicide Forest uh, next year, same time, 2020. Uh, and I started writing a new play. It's been a while, like a year or so. So. What is it about? Can you share? 
the new play. Uh, it is about, it's my, well, I'm revamping a very old play uh, that I wrote, and it is my one other Japanese play and about a matriarch on her deathbed in the family coming around uh, and watching her pass. And when is, where is Suicide Forest? So Forest going up. Uh, ART New York. Shira, Kate, or Okui, what? I'm going off to write at Space on Rider Farm in a few weeks, and I'm really excited about that, and I have no idea what it will yield. Um, I am going to the Young Vic and remounting Bronx Gothic after having not done it since 2015, 16, 15. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's fun and not fun at all. <laughs> well, I think, um, we, I think we're going to have a little reception here, a glass of wine as well. Thank you for um, bringing this uh, almost overwhelming, you know, uh, offerings. I think your presentation was so beautiful. It was hard even for me to relate or ask the right questions. But I think we really got an idea of, um, of all your, what you're working on, and that's different, and that's significant, and that it's deep but also that it's important uh, work, what you are doing. So thank you for sharing, even though it's a complex theme, and, uh, uh, but the work you know you all do, and especially in Julia's upcoming work is something we really look forward to. And I think like a homeopathic pill, the body of the American theater especially needs this anti-poison to <laughs> maybe to heal and to, to get better. And um, yeah, so um, thank you all for coming and uh, for sticking with us. Normally we have 90 minutes, that's it, or an hour, but we have almost two hours here. That's quite, uh, quite unusual, so which is also a testimony, I think, to, to your work. And again, thank you for taking the time and energy and joining us, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, Thanks thank to you. HowlRound for coming.